Let me have you open to the book of Isaiah, first of all. Jeremiah, look at Jeremiah first. I want to look at a chapter, that verse there. You can hold your place in that one. And uh, Let's read this verse here in Jeremiah, first of all. Jeremiah 33. Let's look at verse number 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it. The Lord is his name. And then he said in verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things, notice this after the comma, which thou knowest not. He said, I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And I want to talk to you for a few minutes, and, and uh, I can give you a couple different titles, but uh, in Isaiah chapter number 9, if you'll turn there, uh, there's a passage that, that I, we're going to read and we're going to preach from actually in Isaiah chapter number 9. But he said in Jeremiah 33, I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And uh, I want you to know that you and I have no idea what God intends to do. When, and our brother just met, gave by testimony. Uh, growing up here, living in Kentucky, someone knocked on the door one day. And now they're going to Tibet to work missionaries, Tibetan people. Now, no one ever saw that but God. God saw that. Amen? God saw that. I want to tell you, God has something great and mighty for every person. I, listen, regardless of your age, there's something God wants to do in your life that's great and mighty. More than anything the devil has to offer, which by the way, the devil has zero to offer. He's a thief. He cometh not but for to kill and to steal and to destroy. I've never yet met a thief that had anything to offer. He comes looking to take what's yours. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And friend, that's what I want to talk to you about this, mor this morning. And we're going to get to a word here that's a, a word that I want you to remember about Jesus and about that thought uh, that, of what He has yet to show us. Each and every one of us that are saved, this is a fact. The best is yet to come. You say, well, I know the best is yet to come, preacher, because I'm saved. I'm going to heaven someday. I don't know what heaven holds. I don't know what it's going to be like when I get there. But I know it's going to be better than this life. But I'm not talking about the life to come. I'm not talking about heaven to come. I'm talking about in this life. And I'm not Joe Olstein. I'm not talking about in this, the, you, the, your best life now. I'm talking about in this life seeing what wonderful things God has for your life. I'm talking about seeing the fulfillment of God's purpose in your life. I'm talking about seeing the plan when Jesus saved me, He had a reason for saving me. I believe that when a man gets saved, it's an exercise of free will. God doesn't force you to be saved. I believe that you have to be willing to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Uh, as your Savior. Uh, and and uh, when you get saved, He's your Lord. That's settled. I don't want to debate that. That's not two different issues. Just the fact of the matter is, when He saved me, He's my Savior. And I have no problem with obeying Him and living for Him. And my flesh does. 
But the inner man within me has no problem with it. As a matter of fact, you'll never be more content and happier than when you yield yourself to Christ and obey Him and live for Him. Don't ever feel sorry for anybody that's yielded to the Lord. Feel sorry for the people that are fighting against the Lord. Feel sorry for the people that are like, like Cain was when, he, when God punished him. And he said, you're going to be a wanderer. He said, you're never going to have a settled place. And Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. There's no greater punishment that a person can have in this life than to wander to the land of Nod, not knowing what your purpose is. There are no happier people in this life than the person that yields their will to God after they're saved and says, God, whatever your will is that's what my my plan is whatever your purpose is that's my purpose whatever it is listen it's that way in a marriage you let a marriage begin where there's the husband has a plan and the wife has a plan and then they have children and the children have a plan you don't have a home you have a miniature hell because everybody's pulling a different direction. Everybody has a different idea. Everybody says, well, let's do this way. Let's do that way. No, somebody, there has to be an agreement. There has to be a leader. There has to be a plan. And thank God this morning that we have a, a God who has a plan and a purpose for each and every life in here. And the purpose of God for our lives is not to be slothful in this life. It's not just to float through. It's not just to try to see if we can duck and roll and stay, uh, keep away from serving God and see how little we can do, but the plan for God in this life is for us to fully yield to Him and see what God can do in our lives. If God gets any good out of any of us, it's a miracle, but if anybody's going to get any good out of us, it'll have to be God because He's a miracle working God. And the, the price that He paid to save me is a price that I can't even imagine. The price of His own blood. The price of His own Son. The price of the suffering of Calvary was paid so that I could be redeemed from sin so that I could go to heaven, but more so right now so that I could live for Him and so that I could serve Him, so that I can obey Him, so that I can do His will, so that I can be used of Him to help reach other people. It's, it's wonderful to be a Christian. It's wonderful to be saved. It's wonderful to have a home in heaven. It's wonderful to know that your sins are forgiven. It's wonderful to have a book like this book right here that is without error. It's pure and right and perfect. I thank God this morning that I have a Savior that loves me and cares about me. It's wonderful to be a Christian. This morning, look at this passage if you would. And uh, thank God for this water down here. Amen. Excuse me just a minute. Isaiah chapter number 9 says, Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be as was in her vexation, when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and it, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise. Every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and with fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. He upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it. And to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. And then don't forget this line. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know the most unstoppable force in the world is Christianity. But for some reason in Christianity today, it's, we have this idea that we have to change or accommodate the world. And we have this mentality somewhere slipped in that we have to be relevant to the culture, which is the most heathenistic mentality that you can ever have as a Christian, is the idea that we have to come down to the world to reach the world. No, we come down to the world and meet them where they are, but we come down to them in the name of Jesus Christ to lift them from the world and help them to ascend up 
to the standard of God. We don't bring the standard down to them. You say, but preacher, we can't reach them if we don't do that. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's the devil's lie. We don't need to dip our sails to reach them. We need to be faithful to God and trust in God and know that the zeal of the Lord will perform it. You say, preacher, you think we'll get the job done? I think God will get the job done. And if He if we doesn't get the job done with us, He'll find somebody that will help get the job done. God is looking for willing vessels. He's looking for willing souls. He's looking for young men that aspire to do more in life than just have a good time. Just play games. Just fiddle around. God is looking for young men and young ladies who have a burning in their heart and a longing in their heart and a desire in their heart to yield to God and live for God and see what what wonderful thing God wants to do in your life. Hey, God's looking for middle-aged people that don't want to just coast to the finish line. It nothing, man, I, I haven't got there yet, but it, it seems sad to me when someone lives their full life for retirement so that when they get to retirement, they can live another 20 years waiting to die. But listen, you don't have to do that. Live until you die. Serve God until you die. Follow the Lord. Listen, uh, live for Him. Serve Him. Do the will of God. Don't back up in your surrender. The war, God is looking for surrendered people. Why, why does He want us to be surrendered? So that He can show us His will. So He can show us how wonderful He is. Dear Heavenly Father, bless the message this morning. Lord, I... I, I'm not seeing much response. That's okay. I pray that, God, you'll take the message this morning and work in the hearts of the people. I'm glad you let me stand here. And Lord, I pray that you would help, Father, someone's life to be changed today by your word. And God, encourage us and help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Look in your Bible to the book of Judges just for a minute. Hold your place in Isaiah, but turn to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter number 13. Let's read there if you would. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines 40 years. That's you know, a long time. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive... And bear a son. Now therefore beware. I pray thee and drink not wine nor strong drink. And eat not any unclean thing. For lo thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So uh, this child that's going to be born is going to be a deliverer. He's going to be a, a, a savior to Israel, but he's not the deliverer. And he's not the savior, but he is a savior for a moment. He's going to help to save his people from captivity. He's going to help deliver them from captivity. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God, very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me. Me, told he me his name. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God which thou didst sin come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. By the way, every parent ought to pray that prayer when a child's born. Amen? You don't have to worry about getting Dr. Spock's book. There's a God in heaven that'll teach you and show you how to raise your children. And verse number 9 says, And God hearkened to the voice. And by the way, he's already written a book. And it's the Bible. And that's our guide as parents. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah. And the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine, nor strong drink, nor any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, 
Let us detain thee until we have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. If thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when the, thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is a secret? So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. Whenever he asked his name, he said, why do you ask my name? He said, I'll tell you my name. He said, it's secret. It's secret. What does that word secret mean? Well, oddly enough, it means the same thing as wonderful. You say, how can, how can that be? How can the same name mean secret, mean wonderful? It means this. It means because God has yet to reveal what He's going to do. All He's done is tell them, you're going to have a little child. You're going to have a little baby. And if you, you do what I say to do, then the command always precedes the wonder. You obey me. You do what I say to do. You raise Him the way I say, raise Him to say, and you're going to see wonderful things. And uh, you're going to see things that, that you, you could never comprehend. You're going to, things are going to happen that you, could, that you could never dream of. And by the way, I believe it's time for us as Christians to begin to believe and see the wonders of God. To believe and see what God intends to do. I have a great issue with our generation and the idea that it's too late. You know, it's too late for revival. It's too late for our country. It's too late for the gospel. It's never too late for the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's just one soul that God wants to see us saved today, it's not too late to be a soul winner. If there's just one soul in some foreign mission field that God wants us to reach, it's not not too late for some missionary to surrender and go to that field. But I dare say there are more than one soul that God would have us to reach. And I dare say that there's more than one soul across the sea that God would have us to reach. Listen, hey, there are people all around us that God would have us to reach. But we have to believe that God is able to work through us and do wondrous things. And I'll go ahead and put at the very top of the list, there's nothing more wondrous, more wonderful than for a Christian to be used of God to help lead someone else to Christ. I can't save anybody, and you can't save anybody. Listen, we have the gospel, and the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. You know, we ask people the question, if you die today, would you, are you sure you go to heaven? That's okay, you can ask that question. But how about we just ask people the question, hey, anybody told you the gospel lately? Anybody told you about Jesus lately? Has anybody talked to you? Hey, I, I walked in the other day and said, man, you don't know me from Adam. We never met. I had a ball cap on and, and uh, some walk, running pants. I said, we never talked. I said, you don't know me. I said, but more important, I said, do you know my best friend Jesus? Have you ever met him? Boy, his eyes looked at me real big and, and we started talking for a few minutes. And listen, there's a world full of people. They don't know where they're going to go when they die. They don't even think about where they're going to go when they die. They're so far from God, they don't consider it. They don't think about it. They don't give it much consideration. But ask them, hey, have you ever heard the gospel? Have you ever heard the good news? Why? Because that's the question ultimately that we want them to answer. And if they haven't heard the gospel, we want to be able to tell them about Jesus and tell them about the cross, tell them about Calvary. We want to be able to tell them about the blood that He shed on Calvary. We want to be able to take the Bible and show them and let them see that the tomb that Jesus was placed in was not like the tomb of Mahatma Gandhi or was not like the tomb of Joseph Smith or was not like the tomb of any other leader who once they died, they put Him in the tomb, their body rotted and saw corruption. But when they put the body of our Savior Jesus Christ in the tomb and didn't see corruption after three days he arose and because he lives we shall live also hey the Indian Hindu doesn't have that the Sikh doesn't have that the Buddhist doesn't have that listen the Mormon doesn't have that the Jehovah's Witness doesn't have that the Mohammedan doesn't have that but we have that we have the blessed hope and the sureness of a gospel that never fails we need to let the world know about it let me pause for a minute while you yawn amen amen preacher Amen. Listen. In the story that we read in Isaiah chapter number 9, y'all look at me like you're waiting on me to die. I'm not dying that easy. Amen. Wake my goodness. I don't even want you to know if I'm sick or not. Don't just forget about it. Like, breathe, man. Breathe. I'm not dead. I'm medicated. I feel better than you do. 
Man, if you'd have had some of what he put in my vein a little bit ago, you'd be happier. Maybe you're just jealous, amen? Maybe you see the joy of that. I want some of that. But listen, hey, I, 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 this message, I, I, it was on my heart. I want to give it to I want you to hear this. I want you to find out how wonderful he is. That word secret or wonderful, it was a secret to Manoah. He couldn't know it. In this story in Isaiah, as with all the prophets, Israel is in trouble. Israel has sinned against God. And, and uh, in, in, the, in the days of Uzziah, when Uzziah died, and Uzziah was a fairly good king, and when Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord lifted up. He had, he had been, Isaiah had been looking at Uzziah and he had confidence in Uzziah and he had assurance in Uzziah that Uzziah was a God's man. And so Isaiah had elevated him, put him on a pedestal. Naturally, he was king. But not only that, he was, he was a, a dependable king. He was a good king. He was a dependable person. And so when he died, Isaiah's rug was pulled out from under him. And then along came Ahaz, who Ahaz was not a good king. He was a bad king. He was a, a sorry king. God came to Ahaz and said, Ahaz, show me, a, 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 ask a sign, anything, and I'll give it to you. And Ahaz said, I don't want to. I, I better not. And it aggravated God. You don't want to aggravate God. You know, God said for us to call and heat me and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things thou knowest not. Listen, one of the most frustrating things in the world is if you have the ability to help someone, and they won't ask you for help. With, with, I mean, listen, someone says, man, I, I need help. And I've done it before. I'm the world's worst. I, I've, I've missed important engagements because I wouldn't stop and ask directions. Thank God today I don't have to. We got phones and GPS. Amen. But I remember one time we had a funeral of a young boy that died on our bus route. And I left work. I wanted to be there. And uh, Jess was going to go there. We weren't married yet. But we were going to go to that funeral and, and for Chris. And I left work. And I thought I knew where it was. And I drove all over Michigan City one morning. Just or one afternoon. Just driving all over and all over. And she, she went. I said, how would you find it? She said, I stopped and asked somebody. I said, well, I didn't. Because I knew where it was. You know, self-reliance, it boils down to a thing called pride. You know what pride does? Pride is of the devil and it robs us of the blessings that God has for us. Hey, hey, has ask a sign. Nah, I'm not going to do that. I can do anything. I want to prove to you. I want you to see. Ahaz, I want you to see that I'm real. And I want Isaiah to, to, to be a part of this. And I want him to see that when Uzziah died, I didn't die. And I want him to see that I'm still God. And he needs encouragement. And the pe my people need encouragement. Ahaz, ask me a sign. No, I'm not going to. And I believe that God looks at our generation of Christians and says, Why don't somebody ask me to do anything that's great anymore? Where is the person that asks me that believes that I'm still God and I can still do great things? We've got this mentality that oh, we, we can start our cell group, we can start our small group, but we can't reach our community. We can't reach our state. We can't reach our world. We've all but given up and we've forgotten the fact that God is still God. Amen. There's a God in heaven. He said, call him to me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Why can't we pray that way anymore? We've been programmed to for apologize for God. It's not God we need to apologize. It's our own self-reliance that we need to apologize for that's caused us to come to the place where we think we can do everything with our hands. Churches today, man, they got a book how to build a church and how to grow your church attendance. And Brother, get rid of all that stuff and get on your face before God and say, God, help us to get this church started. God, help us to get this work going. Listen, I mean, they've got how-to books for everything. But where's the person? person that gets a hold of God and asks God how to. God knows how to do it. There's times that you need some inst instruction. There's times that you need some help. There's times that you need to hear from someone else and get some instruction from someone else. But there's a God in heaven waiting to prove Himself in your life. There's a man in the Bible who came to Jesus' disciples and he said, uh, my, my son, he said, He's, he throws himself into the fire and the water and he's, tried, and he, he's possessed of a devil. And the disciples went and tried to heal him, but they couldn't heal him. 
The disciples brought him to Jesus when he came down off the mountain and said, we can't heal this child. We can't do anything. And Jesus looked at him and said, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Where is the mentality to pray and fast for anything? Where is the mentality that we have to look to God and depend upon God and pray big prayers and ask God to do great and wonderful things? And that man, uh, 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 Jesus healed his son and, and cast the devils out. And then Jesus asked a question that I feel like is a very important question. He said, why is it an important question? Because Jesus asked it. And he asked him the question, how, of how, how long has your son been this way? And he said, of a child. You know how long it would have took to solve that problem if he had gotten him to Jesus? But instead of getting into Jesus, he, he probably talked to a neighbor about it. You ever child, you ever kid ever done this before? Yeah, I've had that happen. I wonder what it is. I don't know. I'll just we'll just deal with it. I'll, don't you do that anymore, Junior. Don't throw yourself in the fire anymore. That's not nice. Well, I didn't work. He won't listen to me. Let's go see the priest and see if the priest can help. Here, let's go see the psychiatrist. Let's see if the psychiatrist can help. And let's get this. We need to get some books. Let's Amazon. Let's Google this and find out what book can we get to deal with a child that throws himself in the fire. One day he got smart and he went to Jesus. And his disciples didn't have an answer for him. But Jesus did. And you and I have knowledge of what Jesus did to help them. There is in this city a man of God. Where is the person at that people can come to? And say, would you pray with me? And when that person begins to pray... They know they're praying to a God that does wonderful things and answers prayer. Listen, Israel had fallen into a state of disbelief. Ahaz didn't believe God, wouldn't ask God, wouldn't pray. And by the way, the reason we don't pray is because we don't believe God answers prayer. We don't believe God's able. I'm th I believe I'm standing here this morning because God answered my prayer. Let me stand here. I wish you'd breathe while I'm standing there. Amen. Uh, Y'all didn't take bets, did you? Whether or not I'd die up here or something, fall over. Who bet? Who, who's losing right now? I want to know who's taking me to dinner. But listen, I, I'm, I'm glad for the fact that God called me to preach. I, uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm going to give you this, but I want you to listen. I was just a little old boy, seven years old, raised up on Trace Creek Road. Mom would go to the store and... A to Z supermarket in Hurricane and the pre preacher next door would come over and hand us a gospel track and say, yo, you folks saved. And the answer was always the same. Thank the Lord my mom and dad were saved and brought us up in church. And he said, well, we have a Christian school over here. Never a word was spoken in our home about me going to the Christian school except God spoke it in my heart. And as a little boy, five years old, I asked if I could go to Christian school. Wasn't even saved yet. Fox 11 News when they first came to town. Y'all remember when there's only three channels and then Fox came? And we had to climb the antenna to find a new channel. Amen? And uh, they came, they interviewed everybody. About 12 or 13 of us at our school interviewed us. Where are you going to be when you grow up? Without hesitation, I said a preacher. I never thought that would be the case as I got older. But God called me to preach. And I'm glad that He did. And listen, God can do great things in our lives if we let Him. Look at this thought here just for a minute. Isaiah, in chapter number 9, he talks to them. He said, uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Look what he said in uh, verse number 5. says, for every battle the warriors with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. He's talking about the finality of Israel. He's talking about the total destruction of the city. He's talking about the utter annihilation of the city. And he's saying that because of your sin, what sin? Well, Ahaz, listen to this, instead of asking God to help him and answer his prayer, you know what Ahaz did? He went to the heathen kings around him and said, would you help me? Everybody's going to ask for help. The difference is, are you going to ask uh, Oprah for help or ask Jesus for help? Who are we going to ask for our help? 
I, I appreciate it. Uh, listen, it's one thing. I told the fellow this morning, I said, we're, I'm a Baptist. I said, I'm probably the crazy kind of Baptist, if you want to know that. And the crazy kind, that's the independent Baptist. He said, what makes you crazy? Well, normally we're just crazy enough to believe God knows what can take care of us. You say, how, how are you going to do that? Well, God's going to provide. You listen to Brother Lester Roloff? He's crazy. Why? Because he believed God knew how to meet his needs. He knew, he knew, believed God knew how to take care of him. And listen, understand this this morning. Hey, boys, wake up. No sleep. I, I've been up all night. Wake up, man. Listen. Because of the poor leadership of Ahaz and the Jewish kings before him, when this great king prophesied in here would be born, there wouldn't even be a kingdom for him to set on. You know when Jesus, the Emmanuel, the Lord God with us, you know when he was born, there was no throne for him to set on. Why was there no throne? Because the kings of David, the children of David and the kings before uh, Jesus had uh, made it so that Israel no longer had a throne. There was no longer a king. So now you have a king, but you don't have a throne. Amazing. Not just a king, but the greatest of all your kings. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. But there's no throne for him to sit on. He's born in a nation. Not only is there no throne for him to sit on, he's born the greatest king of all kings. He's born in a lowly manger. And he's swaddled in clothes that had been worn, used to swaddle animals. He came into His own, the Bible said, and His own received Him not, but to as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. His own own people said, we will have no king but Caesar. Remember? They rejected Him as their king. Why? Because they had fully fallen under this Ahaz mentality, this self-reliant mentality. And they had lost the reality and the consciousness of the fact that they had a king. And he was coming. And they had lost their confidence in him. But thankfully this morning, I can testify to you that that great king, when he came to the nation of Israel, and he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He said, Often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks. He said, I would have brought you under my wing. He said, I would have protected you. He said, But you rejected me as you rejected the fathers. And full well, you don't. You've done it. And you've done it unto your own destruction. And so Israel would have to be destroyed. The nation would have to be destroyed. And Jesus would never sit on the throne of David. But listen to me this morning. When God makes a promise, God always keeps His promise. And you can think what you want to think or listen to any school preaching you want to listen to. But when God makes a promise, He keeps His promise. And He promised that someday that Messiah, that Savior, Jesus Christ, would sit on the throne of David. And He would rule and reign from Jerusalem. And someday He will. And guess what? You and I will also. Amen. It will not just be the Jewish people uh, that, that are saved at the end of this great judgment spoken of here uh, during the tribulation here when it talks about that this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And but this earth is going to be destroyed and consumed and burned up. And the tribulation period is going to be a time of judgment unlike any other time that's ever been. And those Jews that call on Him at the end that are saved, they'll be a part of that. And friend, listen, someday, someday Christ is going to reign and He's going to rule uh, from Jerusalem just like he said he would and we're going to rule and reign with him here's the wonderful thing about it when that happens the Bible says that in this story as we were reading here it says that the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end you know that that wouldn't have been so if the Jews had not rejected him and God knew from the foundation of time that the Jews would reject him And when the Jews rejected Him, when they turned away from Him, then He turned to the Gentiles. He turned to us. So that the increase of His kingdom knows no end. And today the gospel has gone out into almost every nation. There are some where it's more uh, uh, 
available than in other places, but the gospel has gone out. Here's a brother that's uh, studying, and God called him into translating the Bible and, and getting the Bible to more people. We have Brother Kruchko in Mongolia uh, printing the, the Bible there and the gospel there and getting the gospel out to the people there, getting the Bible out to the people there. Why? For the increase of His kingdom so that His kingdom can have some people from here and there and everywhere, and they'll come to Him from every nation under the sun, from the east and from the west and the north and from the south. They'll come into the gates of that city. Why? Because of the increase of His kingdom knows no end. Thank God Jesus knows what He's doing. I'm glad He saved me, aren't you? We get to be here to see, I believe, some of the final days in the performance of His plan. The zeal of the Lord will perform it. Listen, the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom. To order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. This world knows nothing about judgment or justice. Our leaders know nothing about good judgment. They know nothing about justice. They can't agree on anything. But if you'll go to Revelation chapter 4, sometimes you'll find the most wonderful phrase there. One throne. There's one throne. Amen? And Jesus reigns. When He reigns, there's going to be one throne. And from every quarter of the world, from every quadrant of the world, from every place, they'll have to come up to Jerusalem. They'll have to come up before Jesus yearly and He will rule and reign and if there's an uprising somewhere Jesus will have it put down so that He assures that there's a 1,000 years of peace it doesn't mean that there won't be the potential for unrest or the potential for this uh, disruption but as soon as that begins Christ will put it down and put it to an end why? because He promised what a king when the queen of Egypt went to see Solomon, the son of David, who was still enjoying the blessing of God as a king. She said she came to see his kingdom. And when she left, she said, I heard about it. But that wasn't enough. She said the half has not been told. You and I that are saved, listen to me this morning. Listen to me. If you're saved, you're not going to hell. That's wonderful. That's wonderful right there. I'm going to wrap it up and just give you that. That's wonderful. Jesus, is first, Jesus, the first name given here, is wonderful. He's wonderful in the salvation of lost souls. How many of you was once lost and now you're saved? By the way, you have to be lost before you can get saved. You remember when you were lost and now you're found? I was blind. But now I see. He's able to save them to the uttermost that call upon Him. Thank God, from the guttermost to the uttermost, He's able to reach down and save sinners. No matter who you are, or where you come from, or what stripe you are, He's wonderful in salvation. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Precious is the flow that flows from Calvary's side. Thank God for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. One drop of His blood is all was needed. To wash away the sins of all mankind. He's wonderful in salvation. I wish I could get people to see it. I wish we could have a desire in our heart to show people how wonderful He is. And I wish we could open their eyes. But they have to believe to see the wonder of the Lord. He's wonderful in the ability to preserve saints. Don't you feel sorry? And I do, man. I feel utterly sorry. I wish I could help these people. These people that are afraid they're going to lose their salvation. I mean, they got their fingers crossed. Well, I hope I don't lose it. You're not gonna if you've got it, you're not gonna lose it. Amen. And I believe if you got it, you won't even believe that nonsense for long. I, you might believe it because somebody told you you could lose it. But I believe if you're saved, along somebody comes along with the gospel and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ and shows you that it's everlasting life. It's not life until you fall. It's not life until you fail. It's everlasting eternal life. You didn't purchase your salvation. It was purchased by Jesus Christ on Calvary, and it's wonderful in the ability to preserve the soul of the saint. Amen. Amen. So preacher, you think you're saved? No, I don't think I'm saved. I know I'm saved. Amen. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall possibly, maybe, shall be saved. I'm no English major, but when you put that 
ED at the end of SAV, that's past tense. That's plural. That's a nautical term. It means to be uh, anchored. It means to be moored to the to the uh, to there. It means to be fixed. It means I'm safe at shore. I was out on the high seas. I was lost and undone without God or His Son. I was uh, given to the wind and the waves of the sea. But when God saved me, He moored me. Amen. And I'm already safe on the other shore. It's just a matter when I get to go across. Amen. I'm here, and the old lifeboat's secured right there. It's got my name on it. And someday I'll get on that old lifeboat, and I'll go home to heaven. And I don't have to wonder if it'll get me there. Amen? My old preacher used to say growing up, he said, you don't have to wonder. He said, the Lord comes along and finds you out and lost in the lost sea of humanity and picks you up throws you in the boat. He said, he's not going to throw you out 12 foot from the shore. <coughs> don't you feel sorry for people who believe that nonsense? That's what religion teaches. That's what many of our denominations teach. I'm glad I have a salvation that I cannot lose because I didn't buy purchase it. He, he's wonderful in His restoration of fallen soldiers. I'm glad He restores fallen soldiers. I'll tell you what, though, I will say this. I'm a little weary of Christians falling in some of the stuff that I hear about. Picked up the thing this morning and got a message from a young man that got a word from a young man just a little bit older than me I like to call him young because he's just a little bit older than me I heard him preach I heard people talk about him what a fireball for God what a great just got arrested for a gross sin I'm, I'm, I don't understand that stuff That, that, that hurts the name of Christ. That hurts the cause of Christ. Go jump in the lake if you're going to do something like that. Amen? I don't understand that kind of stuff. To, how can you reproach the local church that way? How can you approach the name of Jesus that way? Because you've got some passion. If you've got something like that, give that to God and get, get rid of that stuff. And don't, don't toy around with that. Don't play with that. Don't play with sin. But I'm glad too that God in His grace and His mercy restores fallen soldiers. He's wonderful. Some of the greatest servants of God in the world have been people that have been saved. And after they were saved, they got their eyes off of Jesus. They turned aside. If you don't think you can ever do that, then you're wrong. You can. They turned aside and went after the world. But God didn't give up on them and God restores fallen soldiers. And finally, He's wonderful in His providence. You know, listen to me this morning. God never fails to take care of His children. Never. He never fails. People will say, say, how many children do you have? And you know, rumor will get out that i got a couple of kids. They'll say, how many do you have? Seven? It's five? What is it? All ten? Ten. You know, see my wife and say, does that include that one? No, that's 11. 10 plus 1, that's 11. How can you do that? I can't. I mean, I, I know how it happens, but I can't, I can't take care of them. Truth of the matter is, by the world's standard, I couldn't take care of one. But I want you to know this. I have a God that knows every need. And He never fails, Brother Jim. He never fails. He's wonderful in His providence. He knows how to take care of us. He knows how to provide for you. What does that word wonderful mean? What does it mean, Jesus? It means the half has not yet been told. It means I have no idea what you have in store for tomorrow. But whatever it is you have in store for tomorrow, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Every day with Jesus is... Sweeter than the day before. Amen? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day that you're not walking in sin. Every day that you're not walking in the flesh. Every day that you're not falling after the things of the world. Every day that you leave behind the addictions and the filth and the garbage of the world. Every day that you leave that stuff aside and you pick up your Bible and you say, the world behind me, the cross before me. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And walking with Him and talking with Him, you find out that He doesn't get dull and mundane. 
Heard a fellow say one time, my greatest fear is that my kids are going to get bored with God. Brother, get out of my face with that kind of stuff. Bored with God? How can you get bored with God? He's wonderful. I can't wait to get old and see what God has in store. Amen? Live for God. Trust in God. And believe that God's wonderful. With God, all things are possible. Sarah, how was that birthday? I was pretty good for 90 years old. <laughs> What'd you get for your birthday? What'd you get for your birthday? I ain't getting very much. Well, I got something I'm going to let you have. Oh, for reason. You're going to have a baby. What? That's impossible. With God, all things are possible. You know, the doctor told my mom that she'd never have any children. There's a little one right there. The orange shirt. And here's a little one right here. Answer to prayer. She prayed for him. She didn't pray for me. She's satisfied with him. It's hard being unwanted and unloved. Y'all pray for me. Listen, isn't Jesus wonderful? Eyes have seen, ears have heard. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, this morning you'd help us to realize how wonderful you truly are. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings upon us, for your grace and your goodness. And truly, God, you are a wonderful Savior, a mighty God. Lord, help us to never doubt you, but to trust you. Heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. I wonder if there's anyone here that you say, you know what, preacher, I don't even know for sure I'm saved. And we've got people missing all over the place. That's okay, you're here. But do you know for sure heaven is your home? So I, I, I kind of have these doubts about it. But you know Jesus' salvation is so wonderful that you shouldn't have to live in doubt. These things are written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. I wonder who here this morning and say, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna take that challenge that God gave Ahaz. Ahaz failed in it. But I want to take that challenge that God gave Ahaz. And I want to open my mouth in prayer and trust God to do wondrous things in my life and just see what God can do. Anybody like that this morning say that that's, that's what I want? Amen. I see a few hands. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that be our desire. God, we commit it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.